Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. This weekend, we're offering five conversations from Season 3, Episode 37. Our look at cirrhosis patients and their needs. Cirrhosis patients have long been a special focus for this podcast due to the fact that they are the most imperiled of all Nash patients and have the shortest time for decompensation and other severe health events. This conversation focuses on the importance of diagnosing cirrhosis patients as early in the disease process as possible. Ideally, Nash patients will have been identified before they progress to cirrhosis, but for a significant number of patients, it doesn't turn out that way. After I introduce the discussion topic, Jorn Schottenberg discusses several elements of treating cirrhosis today, including the potential to use older medications for some patients, the way that Nash cirrhosis too often becomes the first diagnosis patients here, and the shock that creates for patients. He then discusses the semaglutide late breaker from ILC 2022, in which semaglutide did not produce regression of cirrhosis in a 48-week period, but was safe, well tolerated, and had a good effect on other metabolic parameters, which might suggest some effect on cirrhosis. This conversation picks up on the issue of patient communication and care. I start start by asking whether the issue is completely a function of patient-centered human systems issues or whether better diagnostics and drugs might motivate providers to identify and follow up patients more aggressively. The ensuing conversation suggests that both are important, but at least in the short term, the human systems issues may be the easier place to have impact if these systems can be designed and executed and if payers are willing to fund them. Even though funding is less expensive than drugs and diagnostics, this money is frequently harder for providers or institutions or nursing services to get a hold of. In the absence of new drugs, this conversation focuses on the pincer movement of improving patient communication and engagement on one flank and producing superior disease models, liquid biomarkers, and new drugs on the other. The interplay of the two sets of needs creates an interesting dynamic in its own right. So sit back, listen, enjoy, learn, and when you're done, join the dialogue on our LinkedIn discussion group. What we're going to be talking about today is cirrhosis. We had an episode last summer on cirrhosis that was extremely well received. We've come back to it a couple of times since then with different casts of characters. And there was a cirrhosis late breaker with semaglutide at ILC a couple of weeks ago, in which Jorn is an author. And one of the many one-on-one conversations Lars and I have had that for technical reasons have not made it onto this program was actually about some of the things that he is doing and, and, and they are developing to study and evaluate cirrhosis. So I think this should be a fascinating conversation. And I'm excited to listen. Louise and I have decided we know how to ask questions, and that's probably all we need to do. I think we first started talking about cirrhosis on this podcast. Manal abdul started talking, gosh, Louise, what, a year and a half ago, maybe at this point, fairly early on, about the whole question of how do you treat cirrhotics with what do we have available today? I think that was part of our wrap-up in 2020 was her conversation on that. Idea being that unlike folks with earlier stage fibrosis, where if we have drugs coming, that's exciting. Patients who are cirrhotic are on a faster track to a far more negative outcome. And uh, therefore, the question is, what can we do now and what are we trying to achieve? So, Manal abdul started by talking about the use of older drugs where the goal would be simply to arrest progression. If we could keep people with compensated cirrhosis stable until the drugs in trial to treat cirrhosis are approved and become available, that would be a real win for patients and for providers alike. Since then, on this podcast, we've discussed agents whose earlier stage trial results in regressing fibrosis and perhaps even supporting cirrhotic patients appear promising. We've talked about what the goals in therapy should be when treating cirrhotic patients in the current environment. And Lars and I have talked in a series of one-on-one conversations and interviews that never made their way onto the podcast due to technical challenges about some of the tools and analyses on Taros and others are starting to apply to assess the impact of interventions on cirrhotic patients in terms of looking at the liver volume, spleen volume, HVPG, and analogous ways to get at that kind of data that are an important part of figuring out exactly what's working for cirrhotic patients and what do they need. The goal is for this conversation conversation to be at an intersection of what do we know about drugs? You aren't taking the lead on that. And what do we know about devices? And where are we making progress in terms of evaluating cirrhosis, both for clinical trial and for actual treatment purposes? Laura's taking the lead on that. And with all that, Jorn, um, why don't you come on off mute and let's kick in. Jorn Schattenberg. Sure, Roger. And I was just trying to think back to Manal's comment, which are fascinating, you know, in the, in the absence of effective therapies in the field of NASH cirrhosis, we're falling back to some old substances. And we should revisit that ourselves because there's some data also historic data that statins and metformin are of use in this patient population. But if I take a step back and think about all my patients I'm seeing in clinics, the ones where there's always the biggest surprise that they haven't been identified before is the ones that come back from a liver biopsy with the F4 category in the lab where you wouldn't have suspected um, cirrhosis in the first place. And both the patients and the physicians are shocked because compensated cirrhosis at an early stage is something that 
that's not easily picked up. If I talk to my colleagues, cirrhosis, they are thinking of uh, uh, tensicitis, complications, bleeding. That's, of course, the worst of this uh, advanced disease uh, stage. But so many people are in early stages that are undergoing regular medical care and nobody um, identifies them. And so from all the data that we know on the natural history of cirrhosis and the rate of complications, to me, this is the, the group with the highest unmet need because their line to reach endpoints is the shortest. I know we've mentioned some of the negative clinical trial data here in F3 and F4 patients. That's where the famous 20% rule comes from. Now, maybe that's a little over-exaggerated because it's a highly enriched population, but it's bottom line fact that patients progress from pre-cirrhosis to cirrhosis and to decompensation, which is about one of five patients in 48 weeks in that population. And, and as such, I think this is clearly the population with the highest amid. Now, uh, you mentioned uh, pharmacotherapeutical intervention, uh, data that we presented at EASL this year was accepted as a late breaker, uh, oral, the first late breaker in that session. And Rohit Lumba took the podium to present our data. And it was a 48-week intervention using the GLP-1 analog uh, semaglutide in patients with very compensated early cirrhosis. And while we did not achieve a regression of histological cirrhosis category, you could improve a lot of metabolic markers and there was a good safety signature. And as such, I think this is very informative and and reassuring. Uh, You can safely use drugs that improve metabolism in these patients. And again, revisiting the concept of which patients uh, I'm worried about most is the ones that are not identified yet and are in early stage cirrhosis because they're they're gonna have a big impact on their life in one out of five cases within the next one or two years, progressing to end stage, significant loss in quality of life and the complications potentially even mortality. And as such, I'm really happy we're revisiting this here. I think there's a a lot of unmet needs in that population. Uh, I mentioned identification of these patients, screening strategies. There's no standardized screening uh, strategies across most medical areas. Now, if we're revisiting the type 2 diabetes patients, for sure now uh, there are some measures in place, but I think in clinical practice, a lot of these patients are still being overlooked. Yeah, th- thanks, Frank. I think that all makes really good sense as a starting place. As I was listening to you, one of the things I was reflecting on is the work that Alina Allen's been doing with MRE that takes a look at MRE results, the KPA levels being able to predict the probability of decompensation over a three-year period in people with compensated cirrhosis. If I remember correctly, with the KPA 5, it was 20, and with the KPA 8, it was 40%. But a significant way to be able to understand exactly how much risk patients are at in a way that I think can be executed, if not everywhere in the world, certainly in many hospitals and some other settings. Yes, and it's not only picked up by MRE. I mean, there are blood-based markers, the ELF, for example, and based on the data on the progression to cirrhosis and endpoints, ELF has been approved as a predictive marker in patients with blood logically confirmed cirrhosis and the ELF cutoff here at the high end 11.3 as predictive of future outcomes. So we're able to measure these patients. It's not routinely done yet, but we have to tackle that problem. Somehow MRE uh, and Alina presented great data. She's in a much better position to to tell you about the details of that again, but also some blood-based markers are linked. And revisiting easel, uh, we saw so many abstracts that are linking the high FIT4 category, which is F3 and F4 to outcomes even beyond the very outcomes. So again, I think this is where we really, uh, if we want to change something, can do it most easy. And now back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingthenash.com. We'll be back next week with a new episode of Surfing the Nash Tsunami on Wednesday, July 27th. Until then, stay safe, surf on, and we'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye now.